This morning I hope you will open your Bibles to the book of 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter. Begin reading in verse 9. I have preached from this passage of Scripture many times, but never from this slant. A good friend of mine by the name of Dr. Randy Turner, pastor at First Baptist Church of Laurel, uh, preaches this message at the same time every year. It is the exact same message, and every year his church knows that it is coming. And in the time that I had with him, over the last couple of weeks and some of the meetings that we have been in, uh, this theme, come before winter, has just resonated within my mind because there are things that we do before winter or never. For when winter comes, the opportunity sometimes to respond is gone. An opportunity is lost. And so I want you with an open mind to listen this morning like you've never listened before. To be attentive to how the Spirit of God moves in your life. For you may have read this same passage of Scripture, but you never read it like this before. Hear with me now the word of our Lord, and if you're physically able, please stand. Paul, writing to Timothy, says, Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. And when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls and especially the parchments. Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposes our message. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side, and he gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed to all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, as well as the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. Eubulus greets you, and so does Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. The Lord be with you with your spirit. Grace be with you all. This is the word of God, the people of God. May God add his blessings to the reading of his holy inspired word and all God's people together said thank you you may be seated when individuals come to the end of their life they're blessed if they have their family near them when they cross over from Jordan into the promised land It's comforting to do so with people that you love around you. When my father passed away at St. Dominic's Hospital, it it was a heartbreaking experience for all of us, but 
one of the comforts that we had was all of the children were in the room with him when he breathed his last. We were there, not only with him, but with each other. As a pastor, I've had the opportunity countless times to be in a hospital room or to be in somebody's home when they've departed this earth. I've held hands with family members. I've, I've held hands with that person that has gone from being a warm hand to being a cold hand, and you know that the life is out of them. However, there are times when special people die by themselves. Circumstances and uh, instances take place where they are alone when they depart from this earth. It could be due to a sudden heart attack. They're, they're, they're outside by themselves or somebody commits suicide or, or a life is quickly taken and I have heard the anguish of family members as they've thought through this process and they have thought about their loved one in their last few moments here on this earth that they were dying alone. And they've looked at me and they've asked, what do you think was going through my husband's mind? What do you think was going through my child's mind? I hope that he or she was, was not afraid. And I always come back with this, if they were a believer. We never die by ourselves. Paul, in his last letter to his young protege, Timothy, he realizes the magnitude of this message. And in his closing remarks, we, we see Paul as, as he is encouraging. We, we see Paul as, as he is bold. We see him as he is honest and he is victorious. But Paul, right here in his last letter to Timothy, is very transparent. You got to realize that Paul is passing the baton of faith in preaching and missionary work from his hand into Timothy's hand. We have often wondered who is going to take Billy Graham's place, but can you imagine the responsibility of taking the place of the Apostle Paul? And Apostle Paul is now passing that baton of responsibility to young Timothy. And he gives him some of the greatest bullet points of all time as he is closing out this last letter to his son in the ministry. And he begins by saying, preach the word in season and out of season. Timothy, when it's popular, preach the word. When it's unpopular, preach the word. When people want to hear it, preach the word. And when folks don't want to hear it, Preach the word. And so he is exhorting this young preacher to not be bashful about his faith. He starts talking about his own departure. He says, I am being poured out like a drink offering before my Lord. And this is what he has said. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And he tells Timothy, now what waits me is a crown of righteousness. But it's at this moment, towards the end of this letter, that Paul gets very transparent. He opens up his heart as he has never done before. You know, that's difficult for us as preachers. Because we're not really sure who we can trust. To be transparent and to allow you into our world, to, to let you feel our feelings and to hear our hurts and our anxieties and, and our depressions and our fears, our anxieties. This preacher, this evangelist, this flaming missionary becomes transparent to the man who is going to take his place. And he says this, 
in the beautiful translation, the King James Version, where he says, Do thy due diligence to come to me quickly. Paul knew that he was at the end of his life. And Paul didn't want to die alone. Paul said, Demas has already forsaken me because he has loved this world. Because of the pressure that's been around, Demas has already left me. Then notice what else he says to Paul. Bring John Mark with you when you come. I find that very interesting because when Paul and Barnabas went on their first missionary journey, you'll remember that they took with them John Mark. Somehow, someway, John Mark got homesick, he bailed out on them, and he left them high and dry on that first missionary journey. You'll remember that, right? When it comes time for them to saddle up and go on their second missionary journey, There's Barnabas, the son of encouragement, and the apostle Paul, the flaming evangelist. Barnabas says, let's take John Mark with us. And do you remember what Paul said? You got to be kidding. He's a mama's boy. He'll cut and run when the times get tough. And the Bible says that Barnabas and Paul had a sharp disagreement. And Paul took with him Silas, Barnabas, took John Mark. But somehow, the years had softened Paul's opinion. And he had seen the work of God in the life of John Mark. Which tells us one failure never signals divine foreclosure on a life. And Paul says... Bring John Mark to me because he's such a blessing. And then he says this. Go to Troas. Bring me my coat. There's probably never been another coat quite like the coat that the Apostle Paul wore. Other than the coat that may be Joseph. The coat of many colors. Can you imagine all the places that that coat of Paul's had been. I mean, that coat had rubbed fibers with other coats that he was holding at the stoning of Stephen. That coat had known what it was like to be dripping wet from the waters of the Mediterranean Sea. That coat knew what it was like to have the snowflakes brushed off the shoulder from the mountains of Galatia. That coat knew what it was like to have the blood stains soaked in it after he had been stoned and left for dead. There's never been another coat worn like the coat that the Apostle Paul wore. And now it is turning winter. It is turning winter and and Paul says, bring to me my coat. Go to Troas. And then he says, bring the scrolls with you. The Word of God, because it nurtures me, it teaches me, it encourages me. Bring the parchments, those Christian writings, that notebook, that special writings that Paul had had that blessed his heart, those personal notes that he possibly had written. And then notice what he says. He says, Alexander the metal worker has done me great harm. You watch out for him. Because he vehemently opposes our message. And Timothy, you need to understand. He'll come after you as well. You know, in every church that I've ever served, there's been an Alexander the metal worker. In every church that I've ever pastored, every church that I've ever served, there's been one who has tried to inflict harm upon me. I know what it's like. I understand. David, you know. Wiley, you know. Alexander, the metal worker, is always there to try to bring harm to God's servants. But then notice what Paul says. Paul says, 
God is taking care of me. He says, I, I, I'm in a prison cell, and I'm waiting my execution. My days are numbered. But the Lord is going to rescue me, and he's going to take me into the heavenly realms. I'm a winner either way. And then he says this. Do your best to come to me before winter. Do your best to come to me before winter. Why? Because some things happen before winter or never. You see, you got to understand, traveling arrangements had to be made. There were no British Airlines, there were no Southwest Airlines, there were no Delta Airlines, there weren't Carnival Cruises. You had to set sail in the fresh time of the season. You had to set sail when the storms would not be an issue. When the winter came, the time for traveling would be no more. And so it was imperative that Timothy listened to Paul and travel before it would be too late. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us. But I have to believe, I have to believe that when Timothy got this letter from Paul, he didn't tarry one moment. I don't think he delayed one second. I believe when Timothy read those words, do thy due diligence and come to me before winter, I believe that Timothy dropped everything that he was doing. I think he went to Troas, he got the coat, he got the scroll, he got the parchments, and he was on his way to Rome to be with his father in the ministry. I can see in my mind's eye a young Timothy as he goes up to the steps of that prison and there is a prison guard there and he says I am here to see Paul of Tarsus I am here to see Paul the one you call the Christian I am here to see my father in the ministry and you can see as they led him through the doors they lead him to a cell that cell is open and there's the Apostle Paul and his body has been worn and he has been clinging to life waiting for Timothy to get there. It is amazing what the body can do when it is waiting for somebody special. Haven't you seen that before? A father or a mother or a grandfather or a grandmother will wait till that special person gets there before they will go on to be with their Lord. They will will themselves one more day on this earth. And can you see Timothy as he takes that coat and he wraps it around the body that has been broken, that body that is in its last few hours of life here on this earth? And I can see Timothy carefully caressing and holding his father close to him. I can see Timothy taking a, a cup of water or maybe a little bit of wine and he takes it and he puts it in the Apostle Paul's mouth. He maybe tears off a piece of bread and allows him to eat it. And then he sits there in that jail cell with Paul. And he reads the word of God to him. From the very scrolls that Paul asked him to get. He takes the parchment, the diary, and he starts reading. You see... Timothy's there to witness an execution because Paul's days are numbered. But hear me now. Some things must be done before winter or never. Winters, they come and they go. And the flurry of snow is followed by the flowers of springtimes blooming across the fields. But you don't know if next spring those flowers will bloom on the grave of somebody you love. Or those flowers could bloom on your grave. The time of opportunity is growing thin. 
They are few and they are far behind. By next November, the voices that speak today, one year from now, may never speak again. Let's consider four voices. The first is the voice of common sense. I, I love all of the seasons. I love summer. I love summer, and, and, and I actually enjoy mowing the grass in summer. I enjoy mowing my grass. I'm not so sure I would enjoy mowing your grass. But I enjoy it. I enjoy springtime when the flowers are blooming, the pollen is covering the car that I just washed. It has now gone from black to being a dark green. I love that time of year because spring always brings hope. Fall, football season, gives us something to talk about on a Sunday morning. And then winter comes, and it's cold, and we say, if we can just make it through the winter. You see, common sense tells us that today is the only day that you have. I mean, you do understand that, don't you? You, you have not been promised tomorrow. You have not been promised next week. You've not been promised next year. This is the only time this group of people will ever be assembled together as one again. Ever. This select group. Our numbers will change next week. There will be people here next week that aren't here today. But this group right here will never be together again. You don't know when the next time that you will be in church. Paul said to Timothy, come before winter. Winter or never. Listen to the voice of your conscience. Your character can be amended, but not at any time. Your character can be adjusted. But not at any time. You always have to strike while the iron is what? Say it. You don't strike when the iron is cold. If you were to purchase a wedding ring, or if you were to purchase some precious metal, if you were going to fashion that metal, if you were going to shape that metal, there's one thing that you would do to that metal. You would heat it up. And when you heat it up, then you're able to stretch it. When you heat it up, you're able to form it. When you heat it up, you're able to fashion it. And the conscience always tells us that you and I need to strike when the iron is hot. You have to enter the healing waters while the waters are stirring. Time and time again, you have been in this place. You have heard the promise that God can come into your life, that he can change you, that he can offer you life eternal. You've heard that, but there has been some besetting sin in your life that has kept you frozen in your tracks. You are refusing to move. You have held on to the chair in front of you, and you have not responded. But I'm here to tell you, you can beat this sin in your life. You can beat it through a relationship with Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But you come before winter. Or never. Listen to the voice of concerned family and friends. Just suppose. Young Timothy gets this message from Paul. Do thy due diligence to come to me before winter. And Timothy thinks, 
you know, I just got some stuff I got to take care of here in Ephesus. There are some deeds I have to do. There are some, some, uh, some issues that are pressing. There are things that I have to take care of. And, and, and before you know it, Timothy uh, does all of his work, and he goes to try to get on a boat to head to Rome, and they tell him the sailing season is over. You'll have to wait till spring. And every day for an entire season, Timothy will live with the regret of not doing what he should have done. It will be on his mind and he will be in misery every day that he wakes and every day that he performs his task. He will think, I should have gone. I should have been there. I should have left. Can you imagine the day when he's finally able to sail? It's springtime and the waters are calm and he sails to Rome and he gets to that prison and he goes up to the prison guard and he says, I am here to see the Apostle Paul. And the guard says, we have no such prisoner by that name. Oh, we had one, but he was executed in the winter. Can you imagine as Timothy would sit around and talk to some of those who had been there? He would introduce himself to some of Paul's friends, and they would say, oh, you're Timothy. Paul talked about you all the time. Paul looked for you every day, Timothy, and every day when the guards would come in and he would hear that key go in that lock, he was under the impression that you were coming. And up until his last day, he was expecting to see you. Some things need to be done before winter. Or they're never done. Do you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane? With the weight of the cross that was before him, Jesus took his inner circle with him to go pray. You remember that? It was who? Peter, James, and who? John. Do you remember what Jesus said to them before he goes away and withdraws the first time? He says, keep watch and pray. Do you remember that? He goes off, comes back, and finds them sleeping. And he tells them to get up, keep watch, and pray. He goes away, prays, comes back. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He does this not once, not twice, but he does it three times. And on the third time, you know what he said? Just sleep. You know what happened to James? James was martyred for his belief. Peter was crucified, they said, upside down because he said, I don't even want to be executed in the same fashion as my Lord. John was put in seclusion on the island of Patmos, but for all of the work that they ever did, they could not travel back in time and keep watch with the one who asked them to be by his side in his greatest moment of need. We know that feeling. The death of a friend. The loss of a parent. A phone call that we should have made. And an empty chair speaks reproach. Sleep on. Sleep on. For it's too late. You cannot have yesterday back again. The final voice 
the voice of Christ. And it is a voice that says, come immediately. There's a sense of urgency. I want you to notice that the Holy Spirit, listen closely, because this, this is important. The Holy Spirit never says tomorrow. The Holy Spirit never says, do it tomorrow. Today, if you harden not your heart. Today is the day of salvation. If you listen to my voice. And there is a reason for the urgency. <laughs> you may think that you have other days, but today is the only day that you have. A rabbi told his people, Repent the day before you die. To which the people responded, We don't know when we're going to die. And he said, Repent today. David, in his conversation with Jonathan, said, As your soul lives, there is one step between me and death. That's David. As your soul lives, there is one step between me and death. You know what this is? David, you know what that is, don't you? Y'all know what this is? It's what they call a minister's card. When somebody passes away, your loved one, your husband, your wife, your child, your father, your mother. The funeral home prepares what they call a minister's card. A clergy record. And when I walk in there on the night of visitation... And I speak to the funeral director. He will say, I have your clergy record ready for you. And I'll walk over there. And he'll hand me this card. And I will open this card up. And it will give me all of the pertinent information of the deceased. It will give me their date of birth, where they were born, date of death, where they died. It will tell me their religious affiliation. It will tell me the number of family members that have survived that individual. It will also tell me the ones who have preceded them in death. Since the beginning of January, 11 people who were sitting in the very same chairs you were sitting in today have gone on to be with the Lord. Last year, last November, some of them knew their time was drawing nigh, but there were others that had no clue. They were looking forward to a new building. They were looking forward to a new opportunity. But they've gone on to be with the Lord. The ability to respond is no more.
You hear it? You are one heartbeat away. Every second, someone dies. Do thy due diligence to come before winter. Second, the disposition of a person's heart is constantly changing. There are times, listen, there are times when we are warm and receptive to the gospel. And there are others that we are cold as ice. I want you to think about this room here that has been our sanctuary for almost two years. I want you to think about that old building that we used to worship in. And I want you to think about churches where you grew up and churches that you've attended from the time that you were in the cradle to the time that you became a youth to the time that you were in college and now that you're on your own. You think about all of the auditoriums and all of the churches that are meeting today. If the auditoriums could speak, they would tell us of the Thousands, yea, millions of hearts that would say, I will do it tomorrow. And they left those places unchanged. And the more times you leave unchanged, the colder the heart gets. Today, before the haze of an Indian summer fades. Come before November strips the leaves of its tree. The tree that you're in your yard. The trees that are you pass every day. The leaves will be suddenly taken from you. Come before the desire fails. Come before life is over. Come for winter. Dr. R.G. Lee was pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church for many years. Many of y'all remember Adrian Rogers, but before Adrian Rogers, it was R.G. Lee. And I'm here to tell you, there's never been anybody that could preach like R.G. Lee. One of the greatest pulpiteers of all time. When he was pastor in that great church, he got a call one day that there was a car accident, and a young lady had been involved in that car accident, and she was clinging to life in the emergency room, and she was asking to see him. Of course, Dr. Lee dropped everything that he was doing. Went to Baptist Hospital there in Memphis. Used to be downtown, but it's moved to a different location now, and Dr. Lee got there to the emergency room. Everybody knew him because he was the most popular preacher in Memphis. Everybody in that area, when he walked into a hospital, he always wore a light-colored suit. They knew exactly who he was. They were waiting for his arrival. They took Dr. Lee by the hand, led him to this room where this young lady was clinging to life. And when Dr. Lee walked in, she could barely speak. And he says, my child, I am here. He did not recognize her. He didn't know her from Adam's house cat. She had been attending Bellevue Baptist Church for a long period of time. And as he took her by the hand, she said, Oh, Dr. Lee, I've heard you preach many times, many times. Oh, Dr. Lee, I've heard you preach many times. She was gone. Many of you have heard me preach many times. Many times. Come before winter. Father, we thank you today. 
that we can come to you. This is the day of salvation. If we harden not our hearts. Do your business today. We know that you are here for you've told us where two or more are gathered in your name. There you will be as well. Satan has no business here. We rebuke him in the powerful name of Jesus because he will steal, kill, and destroy, and he will try to convince somebody that they have other days. This is the only day if we harden not our hearts. Today, if you have never trusted Christ as your Savior and Lord, while we're in this time of prayer, you pray this prayer. Pray it in your own consciousness. Pray it in your own mind. But let it be your prayer. Heavenly Father, I know that I am a sinner. And I repent of my sins. I I turn from my way. I will live for you because you died for me. I claim Jesus as my Savior. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You prayed that prayer. You need to have the boldness to share. There is not a single position known as secret agent Christian. These are serious times at Pleasant Hill Baptist Church, and we need serious people that are serious about their faith. We don't need people that are lukewarm. We don't need people that are going to go a quarter of the way. We don't need people to go half the way. We need people that are going to go all the way for Christ. You've been studying about the 3151. Now it's time to put it into place. It's time to make it part of your life. This is an invitation and the call, and the call is for all. We're going to take the whole army, not just part of it. And we're going to change people's lives through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But only if you're winning. In it to win it. Let's stand and sing.